And our uh, today's presenter, she is uh, Ms. Jennifer Ekuk. And Ms. Jennifer Ekuk is a doctoral candidate in history, in historical studies at Imola University in Atlanta, Georgia. She has uh, concentrations in world Christianity and religious practices and practical theology. Prior to her doctoral studies, Ms. Ikoko completed Master of Divinity at the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And also she's having a Master of Theology at Kandla School of Theology, Georgia. She's also having a certificate in African Christian Studies at West Africa Alliance Theological Seminary in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. And she previously served as a director of college ministries of President Church of USA, many outside the Chicago, Illinois, and she has also worked with the Groupi Uni, sorry, Groupi Bibliqui Universali, that is from uh, France. And also, she has also worked with the AAC, that is a Catholic community that welcomes disabled others in northern France. Ms. Ikuk research has been published in mission studies and also in a theological librarianship and also in a journal called Religious History and also in a journal called Les Press. There's a French word there. Ms. Ikoku research interests are in African Christianity, world Christianity, migration, comparative nationalism, empire, and the indigenous epidemiologies. Her dissertation explores to what extent African Christian leaders like John Chilembe drew on black nationalism to meet contextual challenges related to colonialism and the Europeanized Christianity. And they framed new vision for an African church. In today's presentation, she introduces the project and offer a preliminary outline of Black Atlantic that contrasts with the nationalist and church history approaches to the Chilembe historiography. Unfortunately, her research in Malawi has been disrupted by COVID-19. She hopes to resume on-site archival as well as ethnographic research when it is prudent to do so. Let us clap hands for Ms. Ikuk as we'll be welcoming him to take the floor. Thank you very much. Now it's time for Ms. Ikuk to take the floor. Thank you, uh, Professor Teu, for um, the introduction and the welcome, Zikomo. Um, it's good to be with you today, all the way from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So first I'd like to um, thank Principal Jitsulu and the conveners of the ZTC Research Seminar for um, just allowing me this opportunity to present some early ideas that are guiding my dissertation research. Um, and ZTC, as several of you know, generously welcomed me uh, onto campus and into the seminar back in March. Um, my time was cut, sadly, uh, very short. So I'm thankful to continue to be able to gather with you and learn with you over this distance. Um, I also want to note in advance, I apologize in advance for my, uh, how my American accents might skew some words or make some words unclear. Um, so um, there's a caption option that, that may, may help <laughs> with that. Um, 
And there's also, if you need me to um, clarify as I go along, please don't, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, so as Tay noted for today's presentation, um, I want to first uh, provide just a short introduction to my dissertation as it's been proposed, which a, um, a, a proposed, I, I'm, I think increasingly about a proposed dissertation is um, it's a good working document in fiction that allows, uh, allows me to pursue questions and answer them along the way and add to my uh, I have toolbox of thinking, um, but it is, um, it's a proposal, it's preliminary. So I'm, I'm filling it in with the research as I go. Um, so I'll offer an introduction uh, to the project. And then I wanna focus today's discussion um, a little bit in giving a contrast to nationalist approaches to African Christianity, where I focus specifically on Chilimwe um, as he's been treated um, in the literature. And um, third, I want to introduce in contrast the concept of the Black Atlantic and provide a definition of the term as a framework for thinking historically about African Christianity, um, particularly from the late 19th to early 20th century. And then um, lastly, we always in the seminar transition to Q&A. So as we transition, I would like to um, invite you as participants into a conversation about um, the concept of the Black Atlantic and um, for your from your vantage point. So I'm working on this project um, from a couple of different vantage points, um, but I'm, I'm eager to enter into conversation from and learn from um, what questions you would raise and insights you would bring um, about the Black Atlantic from your location, particularly um, in Malawi and in different sets of scholarship. Um, so I have I have found the Black Atlantic a generative way to think about um, African and African descended communities across four continents as co both connected and fragmented and sp specific points in history, which I'll say more about. Um, I've also found it a, um, a very complex way of, of thinking and, and drawing historical connections. And so that will become clear as I, I think, go along. Um, so my dissertation explores to what extent African Christian leaders like John Chilimbwe drew on Black nationalism in particular uh, to meet the contextual challenges uh, related to colonialism um, and their interactions with Europeanized Christianity um, as they framed particular new visions for an African church. Um, so to that end, my project examines the spread of religious ideas uh, through Black Atlantic networks. And again, I'll give a little bit more clarity on what I mean by that term in a moment. Um, so spread of those religious ideas through Black Atlantic networks during the colonial period um, by particularly investigating how Black nationalist ideas um, informed the creation of Chilimbwe's African church in Southern Malawi. Um, so as a localized religious expression of Black nationalist ideas, I I'm preliminarily arguing uh, that Chilimbwe's pursuit of African uh, freedom and autonomy from white oversight was embraced at a popular level across multiple types of communities, um, but it was also contested um, by different individuals and communities and his adjoining African clergy in the, the region. So at the heart of my project um, are a series of, of particular questions. Um, first, to what extent was Chilimbwe a participant in these larger Black Atlantic discourses on human equality, African freedom and autonomy that were circulated and debated through religious movements um, in the Black Atlantic world of the late 19th and early 20th centuries? Uh, second, how did Chilimbwe's Southern Malawi context shape his implementation of Black nationalist ideals, including separatism 
and this idea of civilizational progress uh, via Christianization. And third, how are we to in understand the, the different responses to his work and message among other African Christians and Africans in the region, in the community in the region? I think in particular, um, if you're looking at uh, the literature around Chilimbwe and that history, um, he was actually quite a contested figure. Um, and he's been remembered um, through this, this one particular national myth and memory, which is, is very complex in memory. Um, but in his, in his particular moment, um, he was not altogether readily accepted by all, um, but yet, um, as we know, a number of people found his mission um, and schools um, a compelling form of Christianity to, to participate in. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in and in how he kind of set off both prior to establishing his mission, how he he was a part um, already of a local landscape um, of debates and conversation. But I'm also interested in how, as he developed his church and mission, um, he really set off a series of debates and conversations in the region, particularly about religious ideas and about Christianity um, and the nature um, of colonialism and Christianity and African experience. Um, so following the these questions about the divergence and responses, um, lastly, what light did these particular debates um, that emerged in relation to Chilimwe really shed on our understanding of the broader emergence of modern African um, churches that were furnished with Black nationalist ideas and emphases. Um, so my project is, is really working to um, disentangle Chilimwe from what's called the nationalist historiography and mythology. Um, which, which on the ground there, you know, is, is a much more complicated matter than one story. Um, by particularly teasing apart this idea and this notion that um, has been significantly debated in African historical scholarship, but, but nonetheless hasn't been applied to the study of Chilimbwe. Um, but teasing apart this framework that assumes kind of this, this progressive and continuous movement of, of on the one hand, disintegrating colonial empires and then quote unquote, newly self-conscious African societies into nation states. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm quite interested to understand um, not only the, the political dimensions of, of Chilimbwe's work and other um, African church leaders, um, I use Chilimbwe as a case study, but really how did religious ideas um, motivate him and form his vision um, such that this, this idea of a political nation state was, a, was actually a very um, perhaps distant notion and, and not something on the radar in the way that we think of it um, today. So, so in order to do that, my, my study expands our in, our understanding in particular of how transnational religious movements uh, were able to furnish concepts to individuals and communities that they could then refashion at local levels um, of practice and debate. Um, so to that end, my study is really working to stress the the participation of local African communities in South Central Africa um, their participation in these larger black nationalist initiatives um, that are often treated in this time period as particularly uh, North American and African American phenomenon. But in Chilimbwe, we find um, and a number of other African Christian um, movements and, and churches, uh, we find them um, really taking on uh, different concerns within the colonial context um an apparatus so um so the the nationalist historiography and i don't want to spend tons of um my presentation time here but 
suffice it to say the nationalist approach to Chilimbe, um has has upheld particularly um, African agency um, in a way that earlier histories did not, right? So individuals were treated as, as passive recipients of Christian ideas or as, of um, subjects within the colonial apparatus and frameworks and nationalist historiography and particularly um, George Shepherson and Thomas Price's treatment of, of Chilimbwe challenges that notion and puts um, Chilimbwe and members of his mission, um, and, and particularly of his uprising, front and center in the history. Um, and that's an incredibly important contribution um, in these national approaches. Um, however, what they tend to do from my perspective is, and I'm still right, I'm still in the depth, still plumbing the depths. Um, what they tend to do is put forward um, political ideas um, that that can that can overshadow how religious ideas are working at this moment. Um, and they can they can prioritize the politics over the religious rather than, um, thinking with religious ideas about political change. Um, and, and there can be ways in which nationalist approaches um, prioritize institutional approaches to, um, to both to religious movements and to church history in general. So I'm interested in not only Chilimbwe as a person, but in the broader kind of popular dimensions of his movement um because it was not um what what has been drawn out by shepherson and price and others is that while his mission certainly in his uprising certainly drew from um we know figures at blantyre mission um others who had who had come out of uh, these other missions there's also a, a significantly um popular widespread um, dimension to it, um, particularly as I've looked uh, with women, with Lome uh, immigrants, um, that has been kind of less front and center of our imagination um, of, of Chilimbwe and his mission. Um, so this Black Atlantic, so when I'm talking about kind of, here's, here's some of the, the gifts and the or the contributions and the limitations of the nationalist approach and contrasting it with the the black atlantic what i want to say first it is that um i'm trying to use the black atlantic to to think differently about african christianity in the colonial context um and some of some of you may be from, as a historian i'm very familiar with the ideas of laman sane and his translating the message um, where he's working particularly on um, language and culture as a as a vehicle for um, a renewal and social change, um, and his ideas have been very influ influential to me in how I'm thinking both about um, world Christianity writ large, but Chilimbwe and the the movement of black Atlant black nationalist ideas in the black Atlantic world. Um, so there's no, I think what what Sane kind of has helped me me get at is that there are um, there are ways in which to tell um, stories of African Christian churches, particularly in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, through multiple lenses. Um, when I'm looking at it both from a global and local perspective, and the Black Atlantic really helps me get at this this global dimension of a local movement. So there's no kind of one white or one right way to write this history, but there are lenses or approaches that allow us to to see a person or a phenomenon or community from different points of view and to provide a new interpretation. Um, so I find Black Atlantic is one fruitful way to do so. Um, so I've been using this term Black Atlantic a bit. So um, what is it? So I want to kind of break it down in, into several different ideas. So first, um, it's it's a conceptual framework that was introduced 
um, first in the study of um, particular art forms and intellectual forms that started appearing particularly across in the Americas and Caribbean um, as a way to kind of, the Black Atlantic was a way to kind of explain um, the movement of African forms and ideas out into a broader world and to, to explore kind of um, what they became creatively that looked different from their sources of origin, um, but also added to kind of the, the, the cultural dynamism of, um, of a broader um, North American Caribbean world. Um, so that's where the term kind of originates. It's in this book called Flash, Flash of the Spirit by um, Robert Thompson, who was an art historian. Um, but the idea really picks up, the idea of the Black Atlantic really picks up um, speed and, and weight and import, particularly in um, this 1993 publication by um, historian and cultural critic Paul Gilroy. Um, and and what, what Paul Gilroy wants to do is, is, is show that um, kind of the nation state has been much too, um, too determined, too strong in how we have thought particularly um, about um, Black communities and African-American and African communities intellectual contributions. And so the nation state is kind of always the end and it is, it's the, the point of imagination. Um, and Gilroy says, no, actually, we need to think with the Black Atlantic. And the Black Atlantic is, it's this idea and it's this, this space um, that, uh, that asserts that the, the forced dispersion of enslaved African individuals and communities from their homelands into the Atlantic world was a, was a critical moment in modern history, or critical phenomenon in, in modern history that we do not account for um, how that, that movement informs the imagination. And so and that, that the violence of the transatlantic slave trade created uh, this kind of hugely networked community our sets of communities across uh, four continents. And we, we could say really more um, at this point, but particularly across four continents. So between Africa, Europe, North America, South and the Caribbean. Um, but that this, this slave trade was disruptive, um, but it wasn't disruptive in a way, um, and it was violent in a way that, that destroyed communities but it didn't leave individuals without resources um, to rebuild and to rethink and to refashion themselves in the modern world. Um, so he's he's arguing um, for this idea of how do we how do we think how do we think much more um, uh, in a much more hybrid. Well, he uses the language of hybrid. So in a much more um, culturally hybrid or mixed way about um, Black communities' contributions intellectually, artistically, et cetera, in the modern world. So the Black Atlantic foregrounds the histories of Black individuals and communities' experiences in a way that challenges um, political nationalism as the primary way of um, of forming identity, um, of forming consciousness, of, of making meaning. Um, so then the Black Atlantic is also, so the Black Atlantic is many things. It is not one thing. So it's a conceptual framework. It's, it's also a geographical construct. And by that, I mean, the Black Atlantic symbolizes this, this movement of people, ideas, and goods, um, in which Africans and African diaspora communities participated or were forced to participate um, through the slave trade um, in a way that really like muddies our own sense of national and ethnic and linguistic boundaries. So, um, um, so that, that's one dimension. As, as an idea, so the Black Atlantic 
as an idea asserts, as I noted, it, it really asserts that the, the forced migration of enslaved African individuals and communities into the Atlantic world um, made particular contributions um, to the collective and global experience through the trauma of that dislocation. Um, and, and that that trauma and that dislocation continues continues to to show up um, to I would say to pulse uh, within the structures of the modern world, um, and as as a the Black Atlantic also as a historical reality draws critical attention to the the many experiences of both African individuals and communities and African diaspora communities in a globalized world whose experiences are, are marked um, by violence, by, by loss, by death um, that was instigated through both the transatlantic slave trade and then um, right as the abolition movements then transpired toward these colonial frameworks, um, there was within that this creative creativity and resilience and flourishing of communities on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, to to make sense of of life and themselves within um, uh, in relation to both the dislocation of the slave trade, but also the violence of the colonial system. Um, and lastly, the Black Atlantic has really been used, so it intersects with a lot of um, of other ideas that are being generated at at this point in time in, in the early 90s, mid 1990s, it's it's this theory of cultural hybridity. So by cultural hybridity, I mean, um, it's uh, it, the Black Atlantic gives us attention to the ways in which um, ideas, practices, religious movements, um, are not just one thing, they're many things at one time. Um, and particularly, as I noted about kind of African debates around Chilimbwe, there are many things at one time and, and what they are, um, are deliberately chosen that, that cultural hybridities um, such as the Black Atlantic generates are not just um, by accident, but they're very, they're very creative and, and very um, deliberate. Um, and so this cultural hybridity kind of then symbolizes the, the cultural intellectual traditions um, that emerged within um, a, more, a more global uh, network space in which Chilimbwe participated. Um, so as, as this geographic space, the Black Atlantic and its historical reality, the Black Atlantic made possible um, and, and in some ways necessitated creating means and practices of living in the modern world that on the one hand upheld modern notions of freedom and equality while also critiquing how they were implemented um, within Eurocentric structures and institutions. Um, I think particularly here of, of Chilimbwe's letter condemning um, World War One uh, and, and um, the, the, the conscription or the participation of individuals from Nyasa land within World War One, where he is, um, he's very, um, he's, he's, he's such a, Chilimwe always strikes me, and this is one of the the things as a historian that like that makes me sad. We only have fragments of his ideas and of his writing. He's not someone who, which I'll speak to. He's not someone who left like books and tons of writing. He he left instead communities and practices and and a memory. Um, but I think particularly of Chilimwe in this way, where. Um, he's he's seeing through the limits of of empire in his letter um, critiquing Nyasaland's participation, forced participation at times in the World War One effort, where he's saying, "Look, this war is is not for us," um, and and we can see that and we can name that, and so there's. Um, 
you see that kind of um, that deliberate engagement and that deliberate critique um, of the way in which these like imperial initiatives um, are not um, are not actually for the welfare and the the flourishing of the communities um, in southern Nyasaland. Um, and so the, the, the imperial ideas of, of freedom and equality that kind of come out of the Enlightenment world are, are limited in implementation. And so Chilimbwe and others are engaging that. And they're engaging that particularly through um, their visions of an African church. Um, so I kind of want to pause for a moment because I feel like I've put... Um, several ideas on the table. So normally in the seminar, we, we, we present all the way along and we stop and have a q and A. I want to make um, a couple of, of further connections um, between the Black Atlantic and African Christianity. Um, but I also just kind of want to take a moment and stop and see if there are questions, if that's permissible, uh, from those who are facilitating the tech and the conversation to see if there are any clarifying questions at this point um, or if there's anything you want to weigh on weigh in on before I, I proceed with the um, rest of the presentation. Jennifer, um, Felix, uh, who's on on the line, mm -hmm. uh, or who's uh, on the on the screen, is uh, he's in the chat. I don't okay. know if you can see that. Oh, I see, he's, yes. He's uh, wondering whether or not you could relate what you've been talking to to just sort of post-colonialism in general. I yeah, think, uh, yeah. How, how that, how those two ideas fit together. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, a great question. Thank you for it. Um, I think I'm still in many ways making making those connections with a, uh, more of the post-colonial um, literature and framework. Um, Achille Membe is um, actually one of my, my favorites, if you can get through him, that I hope shows up in this project at some point. But I think absolutely um, this is, um, the Black Atlantic is a post-colonial framework. So it's trying to, it's helping us uh, kind of move forward um, from kind of, uh, I would say, nationalist, but other uh, other approaches um, prior to post-colonial. Um, and so it's really looking from, from our moment in time um, back in a way that, that lends absolutely a post-colonial um, critique and analysis. So I I read Paul Gilroy, and I, I think it's a, a, a fair read. I, I read Paul Gilroy as a part of the post-colonial school of thinking and thought. Um, so what I would, can I add something to that as well? That's fine. Um, what, um, so, Part of what my project is also doing, so my project is about John Chalimbwe, it is about African Christianity, but also what it is doing, it's making a contribution to Gilroy's framework, which is avowedly secularist. So, in fact, throughout his text, like I've, I've gone through and like tracked how he talks about religion, how he talks about Christianity and laying out his ideas of the Black Atlantic. Like, Christianity and religion is always something you have to get past to, to move beyond. So you see um, you see where even Gilroy himself is really dependent on these enlightenment ideals of religion as a thing we have to, to put beyond put behind us in order to move towards a more free autonomous society. Um, and, and what I mean we know and I think we could agree on but, but from different, points of view is that um, particularly in this late 19th, early 20th century, religious ideas are being utilized um, and mobilized to argue for African freedom and autonomy. Um, both, so there's an independent church movement that's percolating in North America, 
as much as there are independent church movements that's, that are circulating in the African context. So bringing those together is something I'm, I'm trying to do, um, or try, I'm trying to scratch the surface of doing. This is only the beginning. Um, so I think often our post-colonial perspectives don't, um, don't give religious communities and religious ideas the the weight they need and the critical attention they need in terms of um, both their their resilience but also their their fragility to do what they purport to do. Um, so I'm taking your question and going a, a step further with it. So thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, in the, you have already started the answering questions. And Dr. Blair has already asked the question. But before we continue, let us see, give a hands of applause to Jennifer. 